Hello? Hello? Hey, Andrew, we can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Great. So, so let's just, we'll mute our phones um, for just one more minute while people get online, and then we'll get started in about two minutes here. Okay, sounds great. All right, good morning and welcome to the ELGL Homelessness Policy Summit. And you're joining our third session featuring Andrew Henning from the city of San Rafael. My name is Kirsten Wyatt and I'm the executive director of the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network or ELGL. We are a big tent local government organization and we work to connect, communicate and educate our members on a variety of local government topics. And today is no exception. Without fail, we hear from our members that their city and county organizations are seeking better solutions to address homelessness in their communities. As ELGL strives to be topical and relevant, we wanted to bring together some of the best minds working on this policy issue in local government and using this webinar platform allows our members nationwide to learn from them. Before we begin, I wanna let you know that your microphones and conference phones are muted and this makes the webinar enjoyable and efficient for everyone. After the presentation is finished, we will open up for questions, and these may be submitted using the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen, and Ray Trotta from Trotta Consulting will moderate them for our presenter. I'd also like to thank Strategic Government Resources, or SGR, for their partnership, which has given us the ability to record our webinars so you can watch them later and share with your colleagues. We will compile a record of all of the tweets from the webinar, as well as the recording and the slide decks used by our presenters, and we'll post these on elgl.org for your review and sharing. And as always, we'll be live tweeting today's webinar. You can follow along with the hashtag ELGL Summit and be sure to use the Twitter handles for today's participants. And so with that, I wanna hand it over to Ray Trotta, who is our moderator for today's event. Ray is a policy consultant on homelessness and she's the ELGL member who first proposed today's agenda. If your organization is looking for strategic guidance on homelessness solutions, please reach out to Ray and you can find her online at raytrotta.com. Hi there, um, thanks for tuning in everyone. Um, if you've been on the earlier sessions, you've heard me 
Pryor, moderate um, and talk to Seattle about substance use and um, homelessness in un unsheltered populations. And then we talked with San Francisco about the Navigation Center. And now we're talking with Sam Raphael. Um, I personally don't know anything about um, Sam Raphael's uh, experience, so I'm um, interested to hear Andrew's perspective on their work. Um, I come from a direct social service background in homelessness um, and also a public health background. Um, and I'm always excited to work with innovative cities who um, are interested in working with our homeless populations um, in new and better ways. So Andrew, I'll turn it over to you and um, folks, uh, please feel free to type in questions as you have them. You can type, the, type them in on the chat box on the left. And then also at the end, we're gonna have about 20 minutes um, for question and answer. So I'll grab them from there. So thanks so much and uh, I'll hear from you soon. Awesome, thanks Ray, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. I do want to apologize in advance. I'm fighting through a bit of a, a gnarly cold right now, so I've got some tea and cough drops. So hopefully, I'm I'm good to go. Um, for everyone, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Ray. Just to kind of put it into context, San Rafael, we are in Marin County, and Marin County uh, is just north of San Francisco in the San Francisco Bay Area. So if you think of the Golden Gate Bridge, we are the community that's just north of the bridge. Uh, in San Rafael, the overall size of the county is about 270,000 people. And San Rafael is the community's biggest city, uh, and we have about 60,000 people in our community. So um, before we get started, I was listening earlier today, and I just wanted to make a quick plug. Um, this is a screenshot from uh, the San Francisco Chronicles Beyond Homelessness project. And so they launched a media effort back in June, uh, and Sam discussed it in the last session. but it is a phenomenal wealth of information about homelessness, the history, policies, programs. Uh, and the first part of my presentation, I actually used some information from um, from this website. So I just wanted to plug this real quick, but it's a really great uh, you know, resource for looking at the history and some of the policy implications of this issue. So um, to get started, uh, I like to start a lot of these presentations by basically kind of posing this question. Um, you know, when did homelessness really begin? And, you know, of course, homelessness in some form or, or being unhoused has existed since the dawn of civilization. But I think what I've learned, uh, you know, recently, especially through my new position with the city of Santa Fe, is that um, the homelessness that we see now is actually a somewhat modern manifestation of the issue. Um, and while we have the benefit of hindsight uh, since the early 80s to kind of see some of the macroeconomic trends that have affected this, um, I thought I'd just run through a couple of them. You know, one, there's been major cuts in the federal affordable housing budget. Um, the number of psychiatric beds that are available to people across the country has dramatically declined since, um, you know, a couple decades ago. Um, uh, this graph doesn't look great, but um, basically I think we all know that, um, you know, economic real wages aren't what they were, uh, and people are having a harder time uh, affording, uh, just getting by on um the minimum wage or, or just low income wages. Uh, and then we see also that just affordable housing has become a, a huge issue across the country. And in California, as in many other places in the country, um, you know, the cost of housing and the rate at which we're building new housing stock is just dramatically lagging behind. So I say all this to say um, that from a local government perspective, from a city and county perspective, um, I think really the last 35, 40 years represent a history of trying. Uh, and I have kind of see it as there have been five major sort of paradigms in terms of how local communities have tried to address this issue. The first, when homelessness really uh, started showing up in, in a larger scale way in the, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, was this idea of the shelter bed and sandwich approach. And um, this is a picture of our senator in California, Diane Feinstein. She was the mayor in San Francisco. Um, but really the thinking was that this was this phenomenon was really like any other uh, natural disaster, whether it be a hurricane or an earthquake or tornado, um, this is going to be a temporary uh, problem. And if we just treat it like we treat other emergency situations uh, by just giving people, you know, somewhere to stay and some food, they would be able to resolve their homelessness on their own. Quickly, though, this idea of beyond shelter emerged. And it was really, I think, the recognition that this isn't going to resolve on its own, and we really need to do something. Uh, and you start to see more investment at a local level in, in terms of social workers and case managers and health staff and mental health staff. But unfortunately, uh, again, with this, I think, you know, large-scale shift from, you know, some of the, the national support to being more uh, on local communities in terms of having to supply a solution, 
um, you know, we, the resources never really kept up with uh, the scale of the problem. So you see the pendulum kind of swinging back and you see more of a, an emphasis on law enforcement. And really, this is where you get into, and I think Ray's going to hit some of this later on today, but um, the criminalization of homelessness. So this is sit lie ordinances or, you know, ordinances against panhandling, things like that. Um, it's addressing the community's frustration about the issue, but it's not necessarily going after the underlying roots. And then that leads into um, really this idea that homelessness is unsolvable. And the best thing we can do is mitigate the negative impacts. And Willie Brown, uh, who was the mayor in San Francisco in the late 90s, early 2000s, famously declared that homelessness is unsolvable. Uh, and so I think that really is where a lot of communities find themselves, that it's just such an intractable issue. What are we ever going to do to address it? But fortunately, that leads into the, the fifth and final paradigm, which I think is, is what a lot of communities are trying to, to do now, which is really implement evidence-based best practices. So now that we've been working on this issue for, again, decades, just like a scientist or any other kind of um, you know, difficult policy issue, we really can look around and see uh, what kind of policy interventions have helped and what actually does work and what's most cost effective. And so part of our effort is really trying to move into this, uh, this you know, most current uh, paradigm for addressing the issue. So if we were to look at this as a timeline, uh, and, and each of this kind of representing the years when these, um, these new modes really started, and I kind of, again, referring back to the San Francisco Chronicle stuff, I mean, really, uh, I think San Francisco is a good example of a community that's moved, been moving through all these different approaches. Um, in terms of Marin, we're honestly stuck kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, you know, really, the past couple of years, there's a lot of frustration from the community. There's a lot of um, emphasis and dialogue about, you know, how do we just criminalize, and not how can we, but, you know, how do we address the negative impacts? You know, there's a lot of fear about our people coming to our community from outside. Um, how can we get people not doing that? Is that even true? Um, and then also just, again, like, are we going to be looking at housing and, and interventions to actually get people off the street? Or are we just going to be, you know, creating new programs that aren't necessarily changing the day-to-day the -day experience for folks in the community? So fortunately, I think, uh, and really what I wanted to uh, highlight today, and I've got 12 specific examples for you that hopefully you can take back to your community, um, but we've really started to make a major pivot into this, uh, the most current um, phase of really trying to implement solutions at work. And so just give you a sense, and I'm going to go into more detail about some of the specifics, but just over the last 18 months, um, some of this even started before I, I worked for the city, but um, last summer, we as a community started, uh, I think there was just an important recognition that our current approach wasn't working, and so we really needed to start learning from other communities. Um, I know sometimes in some places, you know, it's easy to think that, you know, we can just figure this out on our own, but I think what our experience has shown is that we really need to look outside of our own community, find the best practices and the solutions that can really help, uh, and try to implement those um, from, from outside. And so that work really started uh, two summers ago, uh, and then in the winter of 2015, the city of San Rafael decided to create this director of homeless planning position, which is my current position. In the spring of 2016, uh, we implemented something called the HOT program, and again, I'm going to go into more detail about all this stuff. Um, in the summer of 2016, we started looking at uh, creating a multi-service center, kind of echoing back to Sam's presentation about the, the navigation center. Uh, in the fall, we started seeing some of the initial results from our HOT pilot program, and it's been very successful. Uh, and also we, you know, continued to, to really get out of with other programs, uh, especially in our surrounding region. Uh, we launched a coordinated entry pilot, and then this winter we're planning on launching an executive steering committee. So, and looking at this timeline and looking at, at what you can do in your community, um, the first thing I think is really strongly considering hiring a dedicated homeless coordinator. So I know for a lot of small communities or, or even medium-sized communities, um, it's no one's full-time job to really be focused on this issue. And uh, having worked in San Rafael for about three years before I, I took this role, I witnessed firsthand that the city's approach had been to basically have our economic development director be the de facto point person for homelessness. And so you can imagine someone who's basically their sole responsibility is trying to bring in new business opportunities to the community, focus on sales tax. Um, you know, she could only dedicate a very small percentage of her time to this issue. Uh, and I really think that it, it does require a more full-time approach if you're really going to get a handle on it. 
And I wanted to just note here because I, I've seen these types of positions kind of pop up in different communities, and I think there are a couple important characteristics that if you're looking to to hire someone like this that I think are key. I think number one and most important, you'll notice that even in my position, it's a director-level position. And so I attend all of our director-level staff meetings. That includes the chief of police, chief of the fire department, director of public works. Um, and our organization, it really has been empowered to that level, uh, which I think is very key because it means that, you know, when a, a policy recommendation comes forward, uh, it really does carry some true weight. Um, I think it's also important to have uh, someone with, you know, an operational kind of project management background because it, a lot of the things that we're working on now, which I'll get into later, it really requires being able to bring together different partners and stakeholders, but, but move the ball forward in a very deliberate way. And then lastly, I think uh, it's important that, uh, you know, there's always a balance between homeless advocacy, so home, uh, advocating for people that are experiencing homelessness and making sure that, that they're, um, you know, a key piece of, of any decision that's made. But I think you also have to have someone that can be practical and, and pragmatic about the political realities in your community uh, and be able to kind of navigate um, that situation. The other thing I would just note for our city is that, uh, I mean, really any additional support staff that your that your city or your community can provide is helpful. Uh, as just one example, before I even started with the city, uh, our police department hired um, a lady by the name of Lynn Murphy, who is our mental health resource officer. So she works out of the police department, but um, she is out every single day in our community talking to people that are homeless, building relationships, uh, and importantly, building relationships with uh, local businesses, local residents. Uh, so she has been an absolutely phenomenal resource for our community. Um, Lynn is a, a, MF, or a licensed marriage and family counselor uh, or therapist. So she brings, um, you know, some great therapeutic and clinical background to, to the role. So I mentioned something called the Homeless Outreach Team, and I, and I think this uh, echoes back to Scott's presentation this morning uh, of this idea of creating a multidisciplinary team. But before I go into the specifics, I, I did want to kind of highlight um, something that I think all the presenters have kind of spoken about, but really thinking about how do we, with so many people that need help, how do we really focus and prioritize the people that need the most help? So I tend to think about homeless folks, uh, and this is a gross generalization, but sort of falling into one of three buckets, uh, temporary, episodic, or chronically homeless. Um, sorry at the beginning, temporarily homeless. These are folks who sort of run the gamut of um, some of, I guess you could say, some of the, the stereotypical reasons that people might become homeless. Um, it might be someone that uh, has lost a job and missed a rent payment or someone that had a health crisis and, again, you know, it drains a lot of their financial resources and savings. You've got folks that are fleeing domestic violence situations. Um, I've met a lot of people who, you know, through a divorce or other just, uh, you know, part of life experience uh, have ended up in a, basically a short-term emergency kind of situation uh, where they are, in fact, homeless. These folks are often the invisible homeless, and so we don't often see them on our streets in the way that we see some other groups. Uh, and really the best way to help folks that are in this situation is to never let them become homeless in the first place. So we have an organization in, in San Rafael called St. Vincent's. Last year they provided 1,400 households in our community with rental assistance to actually prevent homelessness. Uh, our overall community, Marin County, had in 2015 uh, 1,300 people that were homeless. So you can really see that prevention is a huge, huge resource for, for preventing um, more people being homeless on your streets. Uh, the next group is uh, what I kind of call the, uh, the episodically homeless. So these are people that have uh, longer periods of being homeless on the street, uh, and they often will have not only one episode of homelessness, but multiple episodes of homelessness over their life. Um, often they have some sort of exacerbating condition to their homelessness. Um, I, the organization I used to work for, Downtown Streets Team, and that's what DST members means, Downtown Streets Team team members. Um, we worked with a lot of folks, I think, in this group of, of, of people. Uh, we had people that, you know, had really great jobs and, and were working and doing fine, and they had an on-the-job injury and, and became disabled, and it just drove them towards homelessness, and they had a hard time recovering their, you know, their economic wherewithal. Um, there are a lot of people in our community that have aged out of our foster care system that were never never able to to really marshal the resources that they needed to be self-sufficient. Uh, and then I think there's also, and this is particularly true, I think, on the West Coast, you have this group of people that 
are part of this, I mean, I think truly transient group of individuals that move up and down the coast through our different cities. Uh, and there is uh, a bit of a criminal element involved there. Um, so I think this group also falls under this category. And again, uh, these folks need, I think, in, in my experience, a little bit more programming. Rapid rehousing is a solution that works for these folks. Um, but again, there is a way uh, out and a way to help them. Uh, the last group, uh, the chronically homeless group, and just to be, I guess, technical, the group that I just described is also, it could be called chronically homeless by the federal definition, but uh, this last group is really uh, what I would kind of call the, the hardest to serve folks, and I think Scott earlier had mentioned them as the, the familiar faces, which I, I like a lot the way that he described that. Um, so these are folks that have severe and persistent uh, mental health and substance abuse issues lasting several years to several decades. Uh, in our community, uh, there's a group um, that's been really a, a focus area called the Chronic Inebriate Group, and these are people that have ongoing long-term issues with alcoholism. Um, these are folks that can no longer control bodily functions because of their substance abuse. Um, these are folks that have induced dementia because of their substance abuse, and, and it's been a real challenge for us. Um, this group is also people that are severely mentally ill, so we have people in our community that are schizophrenic, and they're using meth to treat their schizophrenia. So um, this has really been a, a tough nut to crack, and it's really the focus of, of programs like HOT. Now, if you're anything like us um, or most communities, you probably see something like this across these groups, where the cost of, of providing care for these folks rises exponentially almost into the chronically homeless group. And moreover, uh, complaints or community concerns almost exactly tracks with that. Uh, and just a quick note, in, um, I think it was two years ago, Santa Clara County uh, did the most comprehensive cost on homelessness that's ever been done in the country. They spend $520 million a year on homeless services. Uh, and what's kind of crazy about that is only 13% of that money actually goes to local organizations uh, and nonprofits. The other uh, almost 90% actually goes towards criminal justice, mental health, and health care costs. And again, this is largely attributable to this, uh, this chronic homeless group. So uh, basically, kind of tying back to earlier in the paradigm, so when, you're left, when communities are left to mitigating homelessness and just feeling like it's unsolvable, um, a couple of things develop. First is, you know, with limited funding, we want results. And I think there's just in general sort of cultural norms and expectations about how people uh, should end their homelessness. You know, you get sober, you get medicated, uh, and then you get housing. Um, the result is that uh, there are different organizations that develop and they each have their own limited perspective and take on the situation. They're concerned about getting results and, and staff morale. And the result is that some homeless people's needs, especially this chronically homeless group, uh, their needs come last. And so, uh, again, as I mentioned, you have this, this sort of tapestry of services and, and all these different services have their own kind of barriers and obstacles uh, for people to go through. And again, this works for a lot of people. Um, but it doesn't work for some. And so what you end up having, like our community, is you've got people that are extremely difficult to serve to begin with. Um, they fail out of these programs with these barriers. And again, this ties back to the navigation center idea of, of reducing these barriers. Once people have failed out, they become more distrustful of the system. They don't seek help. They get worse. And then it's, it starts all over again. It's, it's a vicious cycle. And so in San Rafael, we have probably 90 people or so that are extremely visible, uh, extremely high cost to our system. And last but not least, I mean, these folks are really, really vulnerable. I mean, they're um, the closest to death and, and they're very at risk. So, uh, again, the question is, you know, being frustrated, what are you going to do? So, in the summer of 2015, when we went down to Palo Alto, we were actually going down there to look at a, uh, a multi-service center, which I actually used to um, work out of when I worked in the, in the South Bay area, the San Francisco Bay area. And while we were down there, we learned about an organization in San Mateo um, that was basically had launched this program called the HOT Team, which stands for Homeless Outreach Team. And what was amazing about this group is that they had sort of flipped this pyramid on its head. So they really put homeless people's needs first. And I think just to kind of, as an analogy, I mean, this isn't a radical idea. If you think about any for-profit company, this is exactly what they do. They, they think about the pain spots for uh, a customer, like Uber and the taxi cab industry, and they really adapt their services and, and programs to help those individuals. Uh, and when you see that, especially in terms of homeless services, uh, when, when these folks' needs are put, put first, uh, organizations begin to adapt, the system begins to adapt, 
funding priorities shift. And again, there's, I think there's more of a reliance on evidence-based models and best practices. So operationally, the great thing about this is this is something that you can start your community right away. Really what this is is a group of local organizations and providers, uh, all of our nonprofits. We've got folks from the county. Uh, and what we did is we basically we came together. Uh, we created a release of information that we would get folks that were in this chronically homeless group to sign. And then that would allow us to all uh, talk about their, their cases and, and what they needed to do to get help. Uh, and our number one focus more than anything else is getting people housed. So the idea is really, you know, you identify your top folks that need help in the community, uh, you get this multidisciplinary group together, and then you really just work tirelessly to um, to get these folks into housing. And so I think one thing that I just wanted to share with you real quick is um, initially this is a pro bono effort. So so we were all just doing this because we felt like it, was, it needed to get done. And um, I think Scott had showed his version, version of this earlier, but uh, you can see we actually tracked or, or created for the very first time uh, the actual experience of people in our community that were homeless and how they were tracking through our different systems of care. And you can see it's just a, a complete and total maze. And our project manager for the HOP program, Howard Schwartz, who's on the right, um, he's a PhD, and he even has trouble uh, helping people navigate through the system. So a couple of just quick things. Um, the obvious, uh, number one, is that um, people are working in silos. That's not really a surprise. Uh, number two, there's just broken communication. And number three uh, is that it's the analogy of the blind man and the elephant, where everyone's trying to grasp one piece of the system and they think they know what's going on, uh, but really no one's seen the bigger picture. And what we, what we learned, unfortunately, quite tragically, is that there are real human failures that are involved in this. Um, so we had a gentleman, he was, um, I mean, he had been arrested for violently assaulting one of our community members. I mean, he had a long, long history of homelessness. And we had actually, through the HOT program, we started working with him. We got him stabilized. He was sober. He was taking medication for his mental health. Um, and then he had a relapse. And that's just par for the course. That's kind of expected to happen. Um, but unfortunately, our county mental health system wasn't actually communicating with our jail mental health system. And so during that, that relapse back to jail, um, they changed his medication. He got even worse. His symptoms, he started decompensating even more. Uh, he was released on a Saturday morning when no one was there to actually help and, and kind of pick him up. Uh, and it just, it just spiraled from there. So um, that's one example. Another is, um, you know, again, we're thinking about client-centered design. A lot of our programs, the expectation is that people call, they make an appointment to get, uh, to get assessed for medication. And the reality is that people that are, are really in need are not going to be able to do this, uh, even though we expect it. And so this is this sort of holiday store hour. This is really their experience, that all of these, these pathways that are set up for them, they're actually really not accessible. Uh, and so it's very important that we start to tailor our system to what they really need. And so despite these challenges, um, this was the very start of the program. So we started with 12 people that we really kind of cherry-picked as like the most visible and most high needs. Uh, in March, when we started the program, this is last March, um, together they had 28 um, documented police contacts. So these would be citations or other sort of uh, encounters. This doesn't include all the 911 calls that they generate from the community or other just um, non-citation-based uh, encounters with the police department. Uh, but you can see within a matter of a few short months, there was a dramatic decline in, in the need for services. Um, the other thing is um, medical transport. So this is just one individual in our community. Uh, he was getting transported by a fire department six times a month in March um, because he needed care. And then we were able to drop that to zero, and it's remained zero since August. So um, let's see. One important piece to this is that, um, sorry, I'm going to cough. Um, one important thing to remember is that a lot of these systems are really, they're man-made. And so it's important to remember that they're program rules uh, and then there are laws. <clears throat> sorry. And so it's really important to, as we're tracking through this, that um, we've included high-powered um, <clears throat> people with the county who've been able to actually look at these systems, like, for example, the fact that people have to uh, call in for um, med appointments, and actually they can make the recommendation. That's not required by law. Um, so what if we actually had our psychologists go out into the field? And so by having high-powered folks involved with the HOT program, 
we've been able to really um, ensure that uh, uh, we're, we're able to change our systems. Uh, and then assertive community treatment is something that we learned about that's an alternative to the HOT program. And I can go into more detail about that later um, for time's sake. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, I can, I can get, mention that. Um, coordinated entry, I think Sam mentioned this earlier, but um, just real quick, I mean, coordinated entry is a system where you basically try to have one <clears throat> consistent intake process for all people that are homeless in your community. So again, thinking about the maze, uh, with coordinated entry, you're really creating um, one <clears throat> one right door, uh, or sorry, one common door across all organizations. So the way you, you do this is you implement a standardized evidence-based assessment tool. Uh, some examples could be the VI SPDAT, uh, or you could also think about even just using the number of years that someone's been homeless as, as your way of, of prioritizing care. Um, and again, you want to think about actually the, the underlying organizing principle for how you're, you're organizing your system. Uh, so for example, uh, vulnerability is proving to be the best practice across the country. So the way to think about this is really like any emergency. So if you have someone that has a gunshot wound and you have someone that has a broken arm, you're going to prioritize the person with the gunshot wound. And that's really what coordinated injury is all about. So in our community, the way that, um, and I'll skip over this, uh, the way that it should really work is that uh, with coordinated entry, um, you have caseworkers and, and folks that are going out and they're assessing people in the exact same way across all organizations. And then you then, <laughs> sorry, um, create a list of the people that are the most vulnerable in your community. And then you want to pair them with the next available housing resources that are available. Um, unfortunately, if you're like our community, um, we have not been aligned, and so we've had a lot of trouble with this. Um, you get providers that are saying that's not how our program works. Um, you know, we don't have ways to graduate people that are currently in our programs. Uh, this person's too high needs for us, um, and we don't have any housing options. And so this leads into number four, which is, is something that we're working on, which is um, creating basically a system change group that can really start to look at, at how we modify our systems. So basically what we've seen through a lot of our community tours is that the communities that are having the most success around homelessness are aligned around a strategy that prioritizes vulnerability and, and have also created these executive leadership teams to actually implement the strategy. So in Marin, we have a system that misallocates resources by providing low-needs people with high-needs services. And then we fail to close on housing opportunities when they're available. And we also have multiple agencies basically working at cross purposes or working on the same issue without actually collaborating. So what we're trying to do is basically get our community aligned on strategy uh, by creating this group and really working on things like housing. So organizing for success. So you can see here that we really want to create this executive leadership group that's driving the overall strategy for our community. Um, right now, um, most of our strategy is coming out of something called the Homeless Policy Steering Committee. And that's a group of our service providers that meets to, um, to basically try to create policy right now. The problem with that is that this group is basically our local version of our continuum of care, which is a federally mandated collaborative through HUD uh, to determine how federal dollars are used. Um, the challenge is that this group is primarily made of service providers, and they're basically meeting to allocate money. So there's inherently a bit of a conflict of interest. Uh, and they're not actually really seeing the system as an overall. The other thing is that they haven't actually been asked to uh, or empowered to actually in, in, uh, enact systemic change. So once we've created this working group, um, we, we're trying to create, or sorry, once we've created this executive group, we're trying to create working groups that are underneath it. So in terms of the executive group, um, they're there to build uh, understanding across different sectors. Uh, they're empowering members to act on behalf of the organizations that they represent. Um, they're setting high-level priorities, and they're holding the working groups accountable. So to get this going, um, we're trying to include membership of uh, different county supervisors, different city electeds within Marin, um, county executive staff, city executive staff, funding organizations, and community groups. Uh, one of the things that we're really working on is housing. 
So Marin uh, is notoriously an expensive community. Uh, the average home, uh, the median home price, I looked it up this morning, is one million dollars six thousand four hundred. Or sorry, one million six thousand four hundred dollars, uh, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is bring together all these different stakeholders, get a better sense of our uh, overall financial resources. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to actually. Uh, basically who's going to own these houses or these certain properties that we've identified. Uh, how do we make the, the money that's available more liquid? So um, just because our city, for example, has affordable housing dollars, uh, it doesn't mean that if a housing becomes, our house becomes available on the market, then we can quickly uh, scoop it up and, and purchase it. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to, to make uh, those funds more liquid. Um, and then really, again, just trying to figure out who is actually responsible for going out and identifying housing opportunities um, so that we don't have multiple groups that are out basically working at cost purposes. The other thing that we're trying to do, uh, a very important piece of uh, our work through the HOT program and how HOT basically led to uh, recognizing that we needed this bigger system change group uh, is really the system change in the service piece. So we're trying to move our community to being um, a full fidelity housing first community. Uh, a lot of communities say that they're doing housing first but aren't really doing all of the, the, the key tenants of it. Um, it's both having low barrier housing, but it's also having, you know, intensive wraparound services. So what we found in our community is that we have a lot of high, uh, high intensity services, but they weren't matched with housing or we had housing, uh, but it wasn't actually matched with services. And so you can't actually do housing first without both. Uh, so that's been an important piece of, of what this group is really looking at is, is how do we implement fully housing first. <laughs> Sorry again. Um, the, the last couple things I just wanted to hit, so that was some of the stuff that we're working on at a strategy level. And again, I really encourage you, uh, if you're a city, to, to start getting connected with other cities or with the county uh, that represents your community, because uh, it's really those conversations that's going to lead to some of this overarching change. But there are also some more tactical things that you can do in the short term, and so I wanted to, to run through a couple of those. Um, first, uh, I think one of the perennial challenges in any community is, is issues like panhandling. And so earlier this year, we really uh, we created a task force. And I actually was part of this before I started working with the city, um, with the, the previous organization where I worked, which is called Downtown Streets Team. And we were really looking at this, um, this, this issue because it, it can be a prickly one. And I think that we had a, a key insight early on that was basically that you know, we want to encourage people in the community to give and to feel like they um, are helping people that are in need, but we want to make sure that they're giving in a responsible way. And we didn't want to, and I think Ray's talking about this later, but we didn't want to criminalize the people that were in need. So was there some kind of balance that we could strike? And so we had heard about something called um, these, these change campaigns, basically. And so the idea is that you retrofit these uh, parking meters in your community and then you try to encourage people to actually give their loose change to the meters versus giving them a street. So we took this idea, uh, and we actually worked in partnership with the streets team. Oops. Um, so we looked at their branding, and we got all this kind of information. And so we, we kicked off what we're calling the Put Your Change to Work campaign. And so we've created these purple meters, which are our, uh, we have our first 10 that are in our downtown. Uh, and so we created uh, marketing collateral, sponsorship opportunities, um, we did a, a big push, and, and this program was actually featured uh, throughout the Bay Area on some of the, the news and media outlets. Um, and then we worked with local businesses and community members to get the signage up in uh, doorways uh, and windows. And so it's been a really, really positive way, I think, to, to tackle this issue and for the community to know that we're tackling the issue without, um, at the same time, you know, putting people that are homeless in a negative light uh, and while also encouraging uh, giving. And to give you a sense of, of the impact so far, we started in September, uh, and from just 10 meters, uh, the street team has raised $1,400 in change. Uh, but the other great thing is that through the sponsorship of the actual meters, uh, through, through the signage that's on the meters, um, they've raised $30,000 as an organization from local businesses and, and different groups. And because the city has a contract with the streets team, uh, and we have very limited funding as a city about what kind of programs we can invest in, this has been an amazing public-private opportunity to help them become more financially sustainable 
uh, and that then frees up the limited money that we have to put towards other uh, investments or pilot programs. Um, another thing that we've done is, and this might be unique to California, but I think it's worth looking at in, in really any state, but this, this originated in Santa Monica. So there's something called Section 25602A of the Alcoholic Beverage Control Act, which basically uh, is kind of a loose uh, ordinance, but it, it's basically trying to say that if you are an or a business that's um, providing alcohol to people that are known as, as to be chronic alcoholics or to people that have chronic alcohol issues, um, you're actually liable for for this issue as well, not just the person that's drinking and consuming alcohol. So uh, in Santa Monica, they've actually gone as far as to um, cite businesses that continue to provide alcohol to um, known chronic alcoholics in their community. In our community, we decided to go a little bit short of that. So we went around to some of the local well-known places where people were buying uh, discounted alcohol or, or single-serve alcohol beverages um, in and around our downtown. And we gave them a list of the 20, basically the top, folks that have chronic alcohol issues in our community, uh, and, and these stores basically keep that updated list behind the counter, and if these people come in, um, they've agreed to just work with us to just say no to selling alcohol to these folks. Um, and, and again, I think it's just another positive um, option in, in the toolkit of how you can best try to um, go after this issue in, in multiple, ways, multiple ways without actually just going after people that are homeless. Another huge piece of what we done, have done is um, focused on um, really just the perception of this issue uh, through our, our PR and communications. So I won't go into a ton of detail just because of the time, um, but if you go to cityofsanrafael.org slash homeless, um, you can see all of some of the past blog posts and newsletters that we've sent out. We have about, I think now, 1,200, 1,300 people that are on our city list. Uh, which is pretty amazing. And so we're able to send out um, basically weekly or bi-weekly updates on uh, volunteer opportunities. Um, I sent out some of the content from this presentation even to that group. Uh, we've profiled local organizations. Uh, we've talked about, again, the alcohol efforts, the HOT program. Um, so this has been a really great resource for us. Another thing that we did, especially when I first started, was I held a series of um, small group community conversations about homelessness. So I know that sometimes uh, people do big town halls about this issue. And while those are definitely powerful, um, what I, I when I first started, I ended up doing 10 of these kind of coffee chats. And so I created just an Eventbrite. Uh, people could sign up. They're up to 12 spaces in every session. And we just met at local coffee shops. We did morning sessions, night sessions. I came in on the weekend, a couple weekends. Um, and we just had a really positive uh, dialogue about what people thought about homelessness, what their major concerns were, um, and it really, I think, empowered looking back at the um, some of these blog posts. I think it really informed, you know, what are people concerned about, uh, and it really gave gave me and my role at least, um, you know, the power to, to respond to people's questions and concerns and know what some of the most pressing issues actually were. Uh, another thing that we're doing is... Um, we're trying to move some of our services to mobile services. Uh, so this is something that's been popping up around the Bay Area, uh, especially around showers. So just to give you a sense of this, uh, we have one local organization that provides dedicated showers to people that are homeless. Um, that group serves roughly 115 unique individuals um, per week uh, with this service. Uh, and that's just 2.6 average showers per week per person. Um, so what's interesting about that is that, well, I guess not interesting, but really sad is that um, we actually have over 800 people countywide that are unsheltered. So that means that only 14% of people that are homeless have access to regular ongoing shower resources. So as you are probably experiencing in your community, it's very difficult to build brick and mortar opportunities uh, for more services. And so we're looking at what we're calling Marin Mobile Care, as an, and this is just a mock-up, um, but um, as a way to basically provide these uh, support services without having to basically build a brand new service center or, or something that's more intensive. Uh, someone that is in our working group who has a background in marketing basically said, when you're thinking about NIMBYism or not in my backyard, it's basically not in my backyard for long. 
Um, so I think that's just kind of playing into the reality of, of the situation uh, in terms of, of new brick and mortar opportunities. Uh, and the great thing too is that this is a platform to then do mobile healthcare, mobile food. Um, so we're really excited about the possibilities here. Uh, a couple other just quick things. One, um, you know, what's interesting about my role with the city is that you know I think a lot of people felt like when I was hired that basically I was now the only person that was responsible for homelessness. And the reality is that we did a, a staff survey excuse me, um, that found that over 200 of our staff members are somehow impacted by homelessness in their job. Uh, that's over 54% of our staff. And fortunately, as you can see from this word cloud, it's not usually in a positive way. Um, it's really dealing with a lot of the negative impacts of homelessness. So we have created a multidisciplinary group within the city uh, with economic development, public works, fire, police, uh, the library, uh, and we're really trying to look at how we can empower our staff to, to tackle this issue. Um, we call our group the Homeless Task Force. We meet every month. Uh, and we've really been focused on three things. Um, one is just, I think, recognition of staff members that have been impacted by this issue and who have been involved in the past. Um, it's, it's really been one of the leading issues for negative morale at the city. And so I think we really just want to acknowledge and, and highlight people that have gone above and beyond in their position. Um, to improve the situation. And then we're also developing through subcommittees of this group uh, a way to potentially document the impacts of individual people that might be, you know, maybe they have a, a negative experience at the library and then they go have a negative experience in our park and then the police pick them up later in the day. So we're trying to figure out a way to, to document who those people are so that we can better connect them with local resources like the HOT program or um, our local providers. Um, one other thing, I wanted to just quickly add this um, from Scott's presentation this morning with just the, you know, especially with some of the encampments in different communities, the trash problem. Um, the organization where I used to work uh, is called Downtown Streets Team, and it is a uh, work experience program um, that provides uh, opportunities for people that are homeless to actually volunteer to beautify the community. And so um, I just wanted to show you real quick, this is the, the branch in San Francisco uh, that's working downtown. This is the branch in San Jose. They work in some of the creeks and waterways. And so I just wanted to highlight that, that there are ways that you can actually empower people in the homeless community to be part of the solution, and so they're not just seen as, as being part of the problem. And then last but not least, we could obviously spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted to quickly um, highlight what we're learning to be kind of the best practice around um, nimbyism and political will. Um, there's a supervisor, there's a county supervisor in Sonoma County. Her name is Shirley Zane, um, and she is really, I think, just dynamite in terms of how we uh, can tackle this issue of, like, getting things done and getting things built. And really, her advice is that I think it just starts with one project in your community. If you can just marshal the political will to do one thing and just kind of rip the Band-Aid uh, proverbially, uh, or you know, the proverbial saying of ripping the Band-Aid, uh, then from there, it makes all subsequent programs much easier or, or um, housing and program interventions. So um, I'm happy to talk about that in more detail and what Shirley's doing uh, in the Q&A. So um, thanks, and sorry again for the, the coughing. Um, but, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. With Andrew, that was a that was great, um, a great systems perspective, and um, it's really good, I think, for all of us to hear different approaches, scalable approaches. You guys really seem to know your numbers and um, be able to isolate uh, folks down to 90 and then 12, and really build your successes from there. So I think that's great for everyone to hear. Um, folks listening in, please type in your questions into the chat box and or tweet them or whatever medium you use, and we will address them in the 10-ish minutes we have left. Um, Andrew, I just wanted to start off with a question. Um, I noticed that you have a, a background in homeless, uh, homelessness, obviously, and I think that has shown, um, shows why you have had su success in your um, role. And I'm wondering if you could speak to those looking to hire um, a, a dedicated position on homelessness and what you feel the role of subject matter expertise um, is to catapult those positions forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of different communities have approached this in a lot of different ways. And I think it is important that 
um, you know, whoever you're going to hire for a role like that, that they, they do, of course, have subject matter expertise. But I think really, you know, what I, what I actually really love about this job is that it, it's provided an opportunity to see the issue uh, as, as just the bigger picture versus from a, a limited perspective of the organization where I was working. And so I think it's just really important, um, I mean, obviously to have someone that has some background uh, working with people that are homeless or, or homeless policy. But I think it's also important that you have someone that can um, basically just convene different groups of people and I think be understanding of, of different points of view. Um, when I used to work with the streets team, um, you know, I had a saying for my, for my team in San Rafael, which was, you know, we need to practice radical empathy, not just for people that are homeless, uh, because, you know, you have to totally just, you know, understand whatever the circumstances might be um, for, for someone that's experiencing um, time on the street. But the other thing that's important to remember is that, you know, the, the business owner that, that writes to the city who's upset about someone sleeping in their doorway, it's really important to put yourself in their shoes. And a lot of the people that, you know, are upset in our community, whether it's, um, you know, families who are, are seeing homeless encampments when they walk their kids to school or the downtown business owner, um, you know, they really um, have invested their livelihood in, in their own business and their own pursuit. And so it's important that we acknowledge that their frustration is valid and important. And so I think, um, you know, if you have someone with that kind of attitude that can see the issue from everyone's, you know, different position or their different lens, um, it makes it much easier to bring kind of disparate groups of people together around a bigger strategy or vision. Um, and then ultimately you're going to have a lot more success because you have all these different stakeholder groups that support the work um, that your community is trying to do. agree with that answer. Um, we have a question from ELGO. What's your total budget, staffing costs included, for your work? That's a really good question. So when we did the, um, uh, I think it was a number 10 talking about empowering staff. So we did a big staff survey or department survey where we were trying to understand the impacts of homelessness in each department. But we also, through that, actually looked at um, the costs that departments were incurring because of homelessness. And our litmus test was basically, if homelessness ended tomorrow, what are the expenses that would, would no longer exist for your, for your department? And so we discovered through that, which I think is very interesting, that the city spends um, $900,000 a year on homelessness. Uh, and, and I have the exact breakdown that I can send out, but uh, what's really interesting is that, uh, as just an example, $200,000 of that uh, that we learned is from the city and different departments within the city having their own budget for security. So the library, for example, had um, was contracting with a local security firm to make sure that um, property wasn't being vandalized or damaged at night, so the security company was coming through there. Uh, but we also learned that um, the Parks Department also had a contract with them. And so part of this process actually, I think, allowed us to see that there's money being spent uh, on sort of the reaction to homelessness, and maybe we could actually invest some of those dollars uh, and more proactive solutions uh, to homelessness. And so, um, you know, for example, I mentioned earlier, Lynn Murphy, our mental health resource officer, uh, we also now have some dedicated um, staffing in the police department outside of just Lynn with police officers that are also doing outreach downtown. Um, we have my position, uh, but then we also have, you know, investments in local efforts like we're trying to invest in the mobile showers, um, the downtown street team program, so I think it really is a helpful exercise to go through and try to understand, you know, what are the costs that are being incurred across each department because you might be able to um, invest that money in a, in a different solution that's going to have a better impact. Awesome. Thank you. I have a question. Um, someone's curious about small community conversations. What was the makeup of people who attended and how did you get diverse pers perspective to talk together? That's a good question. Um, well, fortunately, um, through our – so the, the email list that we've been using to uh, send out updates to the community, that predated um, uh, the community conversation. So, and that has a wide range of different perspectives. So I would really say that's kind of the first step is just kind of putting uh, this opportunity out to your, your residents that um, if they're interested in getting updated on homelessness, uh, to please sign up for this mailing list. And we just use MailChimp, uh, and it's been really easy to create um, nice newsletters through that. 
but that actually just kind of keeps me very open like that. We've gotten people that are, are think the city's worthless and we're not doing anything to address the issue. Uh, we've gotten people that are, you know, extreme advocates that want to see, want to see the city do more, provide more services. Uh, so that kind of created an organic, um, you know, diversity among, among different perspectives in the community. But I really think the key with the, co- the community conversations was doing the event right where um, it wasn't like people were contacting me and then I was just sorting them into groups. We just offered a lot of different times and then people could sign up for the different times. And it, it created just, again, sort of this organic shuffle of different perspectives. And what was really kind of fun for me and what kind of kept me on my toes is that every group would have a different dynamic. So some you would have people that were more supportive of the city and, and of homeless people in general. Uh, other groups you'd have, uh, you know, even just one or two people that would be more vocally opposed and really speak about the negative impacts. So every group was different. Uh, but after doing a couple of them, you know, I could generally anticipate what some of the concerns w- would be. Um, and then we also just, in, in I think, advertising them, just really tried to blast it out to, you know, the local business community, to uh, the local providers. Um, so um, that that really helped. Oh, and one other small thing just to note, the format of those was that we would go around to start, and I, and I would have every single person there just share, you know, and one or two minutes, why did you feel like this was important to attend? And so that got everyone to understand each other before we even jumped into the city updating. So I think that built a lot of um, empathy in the group about uh, everyone's different perspectives. Great, thank you. Um, so it looks like we just have a, a maybe a joke right in here from Twitter that says, why don't you <laughs> people meters? I, yes, I'm, yes. The cash. <laughs> Um, I will say, though, that was uh, – we spent a lot of time thinking about the campaign name. Uh, and so Put Your Change to Work, we felt like um, it really kind of incorporated the fact that the street team is a work experience program, um, but it also, like, you know, talks about the, the, the just the change piece of it. And um, so it, it is kind of tricky how you brand those. So um, I think it's good to uh, – to have definitely a, a diverse group of people to kind of assess and evaluate um, how you name campaigns like that. So I, we have five minutes left. If there's any additional questions, please uh, let us know. Um, otherwise, Andrew, thank you so much. And super interesting perspective. Oh, it looks like, sorry, I spoke too soon. It looks like we have one more question. Um, do you think you have more flexibility and creativity because you're in a smaller community? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I do often think about, uh, you know, the experience of our neighbors that are in San Francisco or in um, San Jose. And, um, you know, e- each community's version of uh, homelessness is very different. I actually worked before working in Marin. I did um, – with the downtown streets team, I, I did work in San Jose and in Palo Alto. Um, and then when I first came out here, I was actually in AmeriCorps Vista with the city of San Jose's housing department. So that was definitely a, um, you know, each has been extremely different in, in its own way. Um, I think, though, at the same time, um, the real key to all of these communities is whether or not um, you have I think a central driving organization or entity or stakeholder group um, that's really kind of taken taken charge of the issue, if that makes sense. Uh, for example, in Santa Clara County, I have a lot of respect for an organization called Destination Home, and they are are essentially a, um, a, a public policy think tank on homelessness. And so the, their board is, is sort of like the... Um, the systems change group that I mentioned earlier, their board is basically that group. And so they have, they've had the flexibility because they kind of sit outside of the traditional provider network to, I think, really, again, see, you know, what are the, the big level systemic things that we need to do as a community to, to address homelessness. And so they've done some really uh, cool and innovative things um, because I think they have just the buy-in and, and the trust of, of so many different stakeholder groups. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, that. I think it really just depends. I think any community sizes can benefit from um, from creativity. I think it's also, if, if in terms of leadership, is the person that is 
the person or people that are, are leading your charge, are they actually encouraging innovation and flexibility and creativity? I think that's a huge piece of it and, and really just building that resilience into your, your stated goal um, I think is really important. That um, wraps up. So I'm going to sign off. Kirsten, I think, is going to come on and close. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was super interesting. And thank you all for um, participating in the conversation. Thanks, Ray. And yes, we have come to the end of today's webinar and a huge thanks to Andrew for a great presentation and also to Ray for her moderation of today's event. Um, thanks to everyone for participating and sharing your time with ELGL. As a reminder, um, we have recorded today's webinar and it will be available online soon at elgl.org. And you can also reference the hashtag ELGL Summit on Twitter to review and share your thoughts from the discussion. And with that, I'll end today's webinar. If you're staying online for our next webinar at one o'clock with Ray Trotta and Jason Dedrick from the city of Eugene, please note that we'll close this webinar screen and then we'll start the new one, but using the same web address for our recording purposes. So thank you everyone for your support of ELGL and have a great afternoon.